Hello, everybody. Welcome to your money map sponsored by the Alliance for Lifetime Income. I am your host, Jean Chatsky, and I got a question for all of you. How are you feeling about your retirement? How are you feeling about your retirement prospects? Uh, according to some recent research, specifically the 2022 Retirement Income and Planning Study conducted by Allianz, 81% of consumers, four out of five, are worried that inflation will reduce their spending power in retirement. Nearly that many are worried that stock and bond trends will reduce their retirement income. Just as many are worried that a recession will negatively impact their retirement income. And women in particular are at risk of not having enough money in retirement due to the gender wage gap, we end up with smaller balances in our retirement accounts. Perhaps one reason that a study from TIAA, the TIAA Institute, found there was more than a $200,000 retirement savings gap between men and women age 65 and older. And just to throw fuel on the fire, perhaps then it is no wonder that the study that we conducted at hermoney.com, along with the Alliance for Lifetime Income, found that less than half of women feel that we know how to make our money last through retirement. That's what we're going to talk about today. And I am going to do it with two fantastic guests. Um, we also welcome you into the conversation. I see some folks saying hello and acknowledging their feelings already. Hi to Sheila and Leslie and Allison, who says she's nervous. We hope we'll be able to quell those nerves a little bit. Allison, Allison if you've got um, questions to ask or comments to make, just hit me up in the chat. Joining me today, I've got David Blanchett. He is Managing Director and Head of Retirement Research for PGIMDC Solutions. They are a global investment management business. He is also an adjunct professor of wealth management at the American College of Financial mm -hmm. Services and a research fellow for the Alliance for Lifetime Income. Um, and he's published over 100 really interesting papers on retirement and financial planning. Margarita Perry is also with me. She is a senior vice president and financial advisor at RBC Wealth Management. And she specializes in just what we're talking about today, portfolio construction, asset allocation, alternative investment strategies, tax consideration, charitable giving, and the whole gamut of things that have to come together to make sure that we have a secure retirement. Um, let me bring them in, David and Margarita, and say welcome to you both. We're just playing a little bit of musical chairs here to get us in the right place. Very happy um, to have you guys here today. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having us. Good to be here. David, let me start with you. Um, there has been an awful lot of talk in the last couple of years, I would say, specifically late 2021, heading into 2022, um, about the 4% rule. The 4% rule that has been around for a long time and was supposed to give us some sense of reassurance that the money that we worked so hard to amass during our working lives would actually go the distance during retirement. All of a sudden, uh, we started to see some research that the 4% rule wasn't really holding up and maybe we needed to revise it. Morningstar even suggested to 3.3%. Can you give us a little bit of background on the 4% rule and talk about what has led to the controversy? Sure. So I think I think it's I would call it a rule of thumb, not like a rule. Um, but the research on the 4% rule goes back. Um, almost 30 years. And really all that it says is that when you first retire, you can take out 4% of your portfolio balance. And that should be like reasonably safe if you increase that amount every year thereafter by inflation for 30 years. Okay. So what's, re what's really important is that it's not an ongoing 4% every year. It's It really just tells you when you first retire, how much do you need? I think that honestly, a, a better way to think about it is, is one divided by 4% is 25 need about 25 times your income goal when you retire. 
And that's really about it. I think that, you know, we're going to talk about this, but, but, you know, the number for everyone is going to be different. That's just like a starting place for what you might need when you retire, because other folks have said, you know, they've, they've talked about 3% rules or 8% rules. I think that, I think that 4% isn't, isn't bad guidance, but it's just a starting place for a much longer conversation. And, and when you say you think of it as a rule of thumb rather than a rule, what's, what's the distinction? Well, because it, I, again, you know, um, for some folks, it's going to be 8%. For some folks, it's going to be 2 or 3%. I think that, that what, what, you know, I, I just had an article that came out yesterday in Wealth Management talking about, like, we need rules of thumb. Like, a lot of people out there don't have the time, the energy, the assets, whatever, to deal with a financial planner. It's just, it's just a fact. And so I think that we, we need a starting place for these really complex decisions. Like, how much do I have to save for retirement is an incredibly complicated question with lots of answers. And so, I mean, I, 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 mean, I think we'd all agree that everyone needs their own strategy. But I think that, that you know, it, for someone that, that, that needs a target, you need between 20 to 25 times what you want to pull from your portfolio when you retire is a good place to begin. But that's about it. I mean, do you think to your point earlier, like the safety of 4%, you know, obviously you've seen a lot of stress in the market in, in 2022. I view it very much as a starting place versus like the final answer of what you should be doing when you retire. Margarita, when you are working with a client or when you're preparing a client for retirement, how do you think about the number? How do you think about how much can be pulled out and and how does it actually work once somebody gets into retirement and has to deal with that little thing called life? <laughs> you know, that's such a great question. Um, and, and David, you're absolutely right. It's different for everyone. Um, the 4% rule, it's, it's a little too rigid for me. It's the numbers that came out years ago is assuming that you have a 50, 50 portfolio, 50% in stocks and 50% in bonds, that really doesn't fit for everybody. And a lot of a lot of folks, especially women, are much more conservative, so they really don't want to have a lot of money at risk. Um, it's a starting point. It's a guideline, a rule of thumb, whatever you want to use. For me, when I'm sitting down with clients that are approaching retirement, it's setting up a budget. It's setting up a wealth plan. How do you know where you're, go where you're going if you don't know where you are right now? So by figuring out what are you spending on a monthly basis? What are your fixed costs? Inflation right now has really thrown a monkey wrench into things for a lot of folks because your money is not stretching as far as it used to be. Are you, your children, are they back home? All of a sudden during the pandemic, kids came home. Um, that's an added expense. Are you taking care of your parents? So 4%, if you're thinking it's just me and my husband or your partner is a very different story if there's more people in the household. So you go back to a plan. If you have a budget, you know where you're spending, you know what's going on, you know what the, the future, or you try to anticipate what the future holds, that helps. And then you kind of back into it. 4%, um, sometimes when you're younger, you're spending more than 4%. You've got you to gotta be flexible. You have to be able to say, okay, we have some unforeseen expenses, so we got to cut back a little bit in the future. As you get older, you may not spend as much money, but then long-term care needs will come in. So it's a, it's something that's a good rule of thumb. We start with that and then we back into it. David, the things that Margarita is talking about are the things that happen in the lives of individual people. And then we get the things that happen in the economy and the markets that also play a very important role on or an important uh, factor in decisions about how much you can or should be withdrawing from your portfolio. Can we talk specifically about inflation and about a down market? And we, we can take them one at a time. Sure. So the going back to the 4% rule, right? The 4% rule it literally assumes that on January 1st, you call up your advisor and you say, hey, inflation late last year was 8.8%. I need an 8.8% raise. You do that every year in retirement for 30 years. Okay. Um, it also assumes that you will deplete your savings regardless of market environment. So if the markets go down, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna do whatever you can. I think that, that both of those assumptions don't reflect reality, right? So 
Um, there's been lots of research that shows that individuals don't increase their spending every year in retirement by inflation. So, you know, on average, if inflation is, let's say, 3% a year, the average retiree might spend 1% or 2% more a year. And that's really important because that builds up over a 20 or 30 or 40 year time horizon. With respect to markets, I think that, you know, if you look at if you look at 2022, was, was a, I call it a hot mess of a market, everything was <laughs> down, right? Um, you know, I think that people are going to be cutting back. And so I think that, that you know, where the 4% rule doesn't work is a lot of these rigid assumptions that don't reflect reality, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's Margarita's job to help people figure out, like, what is the right number for you today, given today's environment? And that's why I think it actually is probably too conservative for most folks, because if, you, if you're working with someone that can help you figure out how you should make changes over time, and you're okay doing so, um, you really can spend more retirement, in my opinion. So where do you think the number actually should start? So I would, so I guess I want to caveat this. So the, a, a problem, if we can use the word loosely with the 4% rule, is that if you use the portfolio in isolation, okay, almost every single American has social security or a public or private pension, right? So your, your savings fund your spending kind of on the margin, okay? So when I think about retirement, I like to think about like essential and discretionary expenses or needs and wants, whatever. You know, the more of your, of your needs that you have covered from guaranteed lifetime income, the more that you can spend from your portfolio than once. And so when you think about, about the average American, your average listener, they probably get a decent portion of their, of their essential expenses covered from social security. And if that's the case, 5% is an okay starting point where you then again make adjustments over time. Uh, Margarita, David mentioned retirement, um, the, the element of social security and, and um, mm -hmm. pensions, if you're fortunate enough to have one, but other forms of guaranteed lifetime income. How do you use that in your practice in order to a, give people the comfort to sleep at night, but also to manage the risk that you're taking with the other investments in the portfolio. Well, it's a great starting point. Uh, first, you have to identify what sources of income you have coming in. So pensions, I, I know very few people that have pensions anymore. That unfortunately is a thing of the past. So what you have to rely on is Social Security. If you've had a 401k plan with your work that you rolled over into an IRA, um, uh, other sources of income could be an annuity stream of income, rental income. So starting with what income sources you have coming in, that's the first place you start. And then especially in, in years like last year where you really don't want to be pulling a lot of money out of your portfolio in a down market. So you start with what income sources you have. Um, you plan. We do a lot of work around when you should start taking Social Security if you have other options to start and give yourself an 8% raise on an annual basis and wait till full retirement age or even age 70. Um, when you pull all that together, then you back into it and you see what your shortfall is. So if you if you need 50, 60, $100,000 a year to maintain your lifestyle and you only have income sources of 30, 40, 50,000, so now you know what your gap is. And then you, when you're creating a customized portfolio, you can back into that number and um, have a portfolio that's generating some income. 2022 was a tough year. And for the last decade or so, we had a very low interest rate environment, which was really a stress on a lot of portfolios. So you had to rely on cash flow from the portfolio. So if you had some good dividend paying stocks that are paying three to 4%, that helped bridge the gap. The good news, interest rates have risen substantially. And so now we are at a point where you can get a 4%, 5%, Money market rates have come up dramatically. And so that'll give you an opportunity to um, have more cash flow coming in. Rule of thumb that I've done for a lot of clients is always keep six to 12 months of cash available. We had years like last year, you just can't plan for them all the time. We had anticipated it because we had such a low interest rate environment for a long, long time. We knew rates were going to go up. We just didn't think they were going to go up that quickly, that fast, and shock the markets a bit. So um, that's where you start. And it really does start with a customized plan. Um, Leslie is, uh, is in the chat and she says, greetings from Tennessee. I don't know how I feel because I stay in denial. I think there are an awful lot of people who feel that way and who, who haven't run the numbers on a number of the things that we're talking about, how much they have for retirement, how much they'll need in retirement, what the fixed costs are, and whether they should cover them. 
with a form of guaranteed lifetime income. I, I wonder if you can address the denial component and how do you, how do you get somebody out of denial? Margarita. You can bury your head in the sand. I mean, a lot of people do that. They hope, oh, the world will just take care of itself. Everything will be fine. That adds a lot of stress. Um, I think the first thing you do is you just bite the bullet. You sit down. There's so many um, budget calculators that are online right now. Just start figuring out where you're spending the money. Once you see that and then try to work with a financial advisor, do a wealth plan. Because if you... Life, life isn't just easy. You just have to map it out. And so if you know where you're going, I mean, how do you know where you're going to go and if you don't know where you are? So if you know where you are today and you think, okay, this is what I need, that re reduces stress, helps you have a game plan. Nothing's perfect. Life throws a lot of curveballs at you, but at least you can start there. Um, denial is not a good, a good recipe for financial success, but um, just take, you'd be surprised. I find that most, most of my clients, once they do the wealth plan, they're not, it, it is like, Oh, I'm not as bad as I thought I was. It's good. So. Um, yeah. I, I find the same. Actually. I think, I think the numbers before you look at them are very scary. And once you look at them, often they allow you to take a little bit of a breath or they allow you to acknowledge that there are different levers that you have to pull on or push on in order to change your picture going forward. We look at how long we're working, how much we're saving. David, can you talk about the levers that people can toggle in order to make a a small change or even a dramatic change in what their retirement scenario can look like? Sure. So there's like, there's, there's kind of always the same levers, but they affect the outcome a lot differently. So like saving for retirement is, is really, really impactful. If you're 25 years old, if you're a year from retirement, you can't get there through savings, right? Um, investing appropriately is also really important. The more wealth you have, I would never suggest taking on too much risk. We see what happens when individuals take on too much risk. What's interesting, though, is one of the most important variables about retirement outcomes is the one that people have less control than they think to do, which is when they're actually going to retire, right? So delayed retirement is incredibly powerful, right? So if you delay retirement one year, you have one more year to save, one more year for your assets to grow, um, one less year to, to plan for, and one more year to delay claiming Social Security, really, really powerful. So like the one like silver bullet out there is, is delayed retirement. But here's the thing, though. Most Americans retire three years earlier than they expect to, right? And most retirements are involuntary. And so like the one the one point that I make when I'm talking to advisors a lot is that is that while your clients might be telling you that they're going to work till they're 65 or 70, most folks aren't going to get there. So if you want like the, the silver bullet, it really is delayed retirement. But I think that everyone listening needs to be ready for the fact that there's a really good chance that you're going to retire a few years before you're planning on doing so and, and ask yourself this question, what does this mean for my retirement if that happens? Very important. The other uncontrollable factor is longevity. Um, and and I mean, it's interesting that you're saying people are likely to retire sooner than they anticipate, but they're likely to live longer than they anticipate. So how do you solve for that? So longevity is the so that that's that's like you can't do anything about that i mean i guess that way you can start smoking if you wanted to reduce your retirement period i'm not recommending that at all Please don't. Um, not, not, a, not a not a really good financial strategy there but i guess like the key is is that you know i was on a call earlier today we're talking about a company and and like the five benefit plans for whatever they're amazing like they just they just simplify retirement it makes it so easy Right, when you don't have to worry about how long I'm going to live, what do the markets do? And I think that, that it's called idiosyncratic longevity. We're all going to live different amounts of time, right? And we have no idea how long it's going to be. And that uncertainty causes, it causes the biggest problems for retirement, right? And I think that, that you know, when, when individuals think about, you know, how do I handle how, longevity? I think, I think the most important question to ask is, is do you have as much as you need, no matter how long you're going to live? Right. If you cannot affirmatively answer yes to that question, here's what's going to happen. You're not going to enjoy your retirement. You're going to be worried all the time. You're going to panic when the market goes down. And so that, you know, it's funny. I spent all this time researching retirement and, and optimal portfolios. And, and, and I think the biggest things here are behavioral. Right? You want to set yourself up no matter how long you live. 
you're taking care of. Because if you don't have that done, it's hard to enjoy the rest of the stuff. So I think that, you know, delay claiming social security, allocating to annuity, finding ways to generate guaranteed income is an essential component of, of every retirement plan. Well, we got a question about guaranteed income. And, and um, we also, we've got a number of questions. I want to, I want to go through them, but um, Jennifer said, please advise what's the best for retirement among index annuity indexed fixed annuity and mutual funds. Those are big categories. Um, Margarita, you want to tackle that? Well, they're all there. There could be all one in, in one because an annuity right. can have basically a mutual fund uh, component. You can have a fixed annuity, a lot of different choices. I think it's you never want to put all your eggs in one basket. You want to have diversification. And I think that's very, very important. And, um, you know, David alluded to that. I mean, you want to have different sources of income coming in um, to allow you to meet your your needs. And if you if you retire early, you need to plan for that. Um Fixed annuities. I mean, there are fixed annuities are, are a solution for a some have a guaranteed income stream for life that that will take a little bit of pressure off. Um, it may augment your Social Security. If you have a little bit of a pension, that'll help. Um, it may even help you delay taking Social Security that you can give yourself a raise and not um, have to take Social Security at 62 years of age if you retire early. Um, mutual funds make sense. I mean, they're diversified baskets of securities, but they're all different types. So you have to make sure that um, I remember back in, you know, I've been doing this now almost 40 years and and uh, back when the dot com bubble and everything blew up and clients could, but I'm well diversified. I have all these mutual funds <laughs> and I'm looking at them. I'm going, yes, you have five different mutual funds, different companies, but the top 10 stocks are all the same. <laughs> They're all internet stocks. No wonder you're down 50, 60%. So you have to know what you're buying. And um, it's it's not also chasing the hot dot every year. Last year was the great, that oh, that was an up 50%, whatnot. Um, again, back to having a wealth plan and uh, looking at, and, and I what I do with my clients is our wealth plan, we, we are where we are today. Where do we want to be? And so we're mapping that out. And then we do what if scenarios. What if you do have a life event that you have to retire early or somebody passes away, something happens? What if you extend? So if you have, a, it's a roadmap. And if you have some different options, you can kind of plan accordingly. Um, I do think that annuities do play a role and do take pressure off of the portfolios at time. Last year was a good example. Um, I had a client that retired. She was a nurse and it was just too much with the pandemic. And she said, I can't wait till 65. Back to your point, David, she was 62. And I said, well, you really don't want to tap into Social Security right now. Let's look at your annuity and let's tap into that. If we can wait another couple of years, you might get a 5%. So you're not back to that 4% rule if you're pulling that out. So those are just different levers that you can pull, but it's, uh, they all make sense. Um, and it just, it's the combination, the diversification that you have a balanced portfolio is the key to a financial success in the future. You're using the term wealth plan, and it's a new term to some of our viewers. They're asking questions about it. Is it just another word for financial plan? It is. It is. I mean, it's, um, I look at it because it, it is, it's what you've built for years and, um, it's your wealth and how you decide to spend your wealth down over, you know, in retirement and whatnot. But it's, it's pretty much the same thing. But it's better than a normal financial plan, right? Yes, it's much more in depth. Um, I absolutely, I mean, my plans are a look at everything. Uh, so often clients, just, they think in a little, their little bubble of, you know, what I have to take care of me. I, no, I mean, I think we've all learned now that we all have folks that are older up in years and they didn't think back to the longevity risk that they were going to live so long. And all of a sudden they're having stresses on taking care of their long-term care needs. Uh, the baby boomers are in a sandwich generation where they have either their parents on one side and their kids. And most women never say no. <laughs> they always try to help out where they can. So you, you got to delve deep and, you know, social security analysis when you're taking that, um, uh, you know, if you've got a pension, I have clients retiring and they're going, well, do I take a lump sum annuity or do I take it for joint life, single life? So we delve into all of that. And that that's super important. It's not just a simple financial plan. 
I, I think what you're talking about in in a in a broad um, way is is the value of advice, the value of getting advice at specific points in your life or continuously. Um, I know that there's been research, David, on the value of advice that boils it down to a number, but there's also been research that looks at it from a psychological perspective. What is, what is getting help do for people? So, yeah, I mean, so I've done research, I, I call it Gamma, Vanguard calls it Advisors Alpha, Investment calls it Capital Sigma, someone else called it Zeta, all, all these fun ways to kind of quantify what it means. And I think that, that if you think about financial advisors 20 or 30 years ago, you might define their value as I'm going to pick investment stocks that beat the market, right? But in reality, like that's, that's important. Investments are important. I'm not, I would never say they're not, but everything else is so much more valuable. Right. You know, helping someone figure out how much they can spend, when they can retire, how much they should save, all those things that adds a tremendous amount of value. And so I think that, that you know, like while advisors still are predominantly paid based on managing money, it, it's, it's increasingly not the money stuff that really, I think, where they create the most value. And so I would just say that, you know, for those of you that work with an advisor, make sure that they do more for you than just build a good portfolio, because that's not as hard as it used to be, right? There's a lot of tools online that can help with that. Work with someone that really is helping you understand what you're trying to accomplish, how you're doing it, that really is taking a holistic perspective on all the different strategies out there. Yeah. And, and don't be cowed by the word wealth. I mean, I like how you said a wealth plan is better than any old financial plan. But but often I think people hear that and they think, well, I'm not wealthy. I I, I don't qual I don't qualify for a wealth plan. Wealth doesn't mean me. We got we got a, a comment in the in the chat that wealth often gets confused with wealthy. And there are across the spectrum now, I think many more options in terms of how to access financial advice at at all levels of income. If you go to our website, which is protectedincome.org, you'll, you'll find a lot of information about the questions to ask a financial advisor and how to find a financial advisor. But I'm, I'm always, um, not amazed is the wrong word, but, but pleasantly surprised at how democratic this field has been become david you're nodding so i you know you know some advisors feel different but i i love this rise of robo advice right I, to me i think one of my like overriding missions in life is helping people make better choices and i think that the more access points that we create in the industry the more that we're going to do right it is not it is not physically possible for every advisor out there to help every american accomplish their goals. There's, not, there's not enough of us right if, if you come in that bucket and so i think that we need to have differentiated solutions and so you know like I mean, I don't know that, that Google is the answer, but you have to start somewhere, right? You know, like I think I think researching retirement and then for those of you that, that want help, I would just I would actively encourage you to find someone that can help you because there's there's, there's lots of ways you can do that now, not only like digital versus in person, but um, advice can just be can be great for help. Um, I want to just encourage anybody who's listening or watching, let you know if you have a question for David or Margarita or both, um, please go ahead and, and pop it in the comments. We would love to love to get to that. Margarita, I want to come back to something that that uh, that I led with at, at the beginning, um, which is that uh, there is a lot of fear around this idea of running out of money in retirement. It is, it is uh, according to a number of studies that I've seen, it is the number one mm -hmm. fear. And yet we, um, we don't necessarily have a, a roadmap to follow that will prevent us from doing that. So what is your roadmap that prevents that outcome from happening? Well, it really goes back to what we've been talking about, um, you know, this afternoon about knowing where you're spending the money. I mean, uh, it's you have to start there. And well, you've mentioned a budget, and and I think sometimes we think of a budget as something your twenty year old college kids need when they graduate and are trying to make the the numbers work on their first salary. I mean, you're you're talking about it in in retirement as a lifetime tool. Can you explain why it's so fundamental? 
Oh, it is absolutely fundamental. Um, if, especially in retirement, because you're, you're now, you've gone through the accumulation, you've been working for years and years and years, you've been building your little nest egg, and then you decide that you want to retire. And so I always suggest to my clients right before they're thinking about retiring is you start shifting. It's a transition. Um, you start shifting towards maybe being a little more conservative, really focusing on where you're spending the money and making those decisions that do I take this big trip um, you know, to Europe or do I take smaller trips? What is your goal? So if you if you have that wealth plan in place, you have a roadmap, you have money set aside you also think about what long-term care may be because back to that longevity risk, if you do retire early and uh, there are statistics and I think it was on Alliance um, on your website where um, a married couple that is 65 years of age, one of the two have a 50% chance of living to the age of 92, one, 25% 98. So when I do my wealth plan, I actually run it until, 19, until you're 94 just to look at the worst case scenario. So if you look at the worst case scenario and you plan and you and you you spend and you spend accordingly and and yes when you're younger you're spending and gosh when I was younger anything that was in my checking account was fair game. And so get it out of your checking account. Look at different options to invest. Um, have that clear budget. Be realistic. Most people say, "Oh, I don't spend that much money." I'm shocked that um, in in my practice and I've seen this um, and I believe Alliance has done some work on this as well, that 20% of people actually have a budget, have a plan, and even stick to it, that, that's not, that's not going to help you in the times where your fear of running out of money, because that is the number one thing that I see with clients. And it's not just with somebody that is lived from paycheck to paycheck. It's also wealthy, wealthy clients. It's, it's natural. It's something that people fear. Um, either they're older and they've gone through the depression or their parents have, or younger folks that, gosh, I have a college degree and I can't get a job. It's, it's amazing. So um, again, uh, I, not to beat a dead horse, but I think if you plan and you do work with an advisor, uh, there are a lot of sources that are out there. And the days of being a stock jock where you're picking a great stock and I'm, oh, I want to find the I IPO and I want to make more money. Gosh, the dot coms, I remember it. I had 70, 80 year old clients call me up going, well, I was at a cocktail party and I want to buy it. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, no, at this point in your life, that's not what we want to be doing. <laughs> so um, again, back to David's point, have, have you know, ask that question. Um, your financial advisor is there. I mean, we're, we're like, um, you know, some days we're financial therapists and some days we are, uh, you know, more of a financial life coach of trying to help you chart your path where you can, you know, make sure that there is enough money at the end of the rainbow. And of course, the selection of securities, buying stocks and bonds to me is secondary. Once you have a strategy in place, it all falls into place. That that is a that is a an interesting point. Buying stocks and bonds is is secondary. Um, the other rule of thumb that made a lot of headlines last year was this idea that a sixty forty portfolio, sixty percent stocks, forty percent fixed income, um, the the mix that pension funds have relied on for years was dead. Um, and it was dead because as, as what did you call last year? A hot mess, David? Hot mess. It was, yeah. it was dead because last year was a hot mess, right? And both stocks and bonds had a really terrible year. And so they couldn't be counted on to keep each other in balance. Um, as we wind down this conversation, um, 60, 40 mix, David, where, where do you think we are in terms of that making sense for the long term? I think it's still more than applicable for lots of people. I think that there's an interesting anomaly today where you can actually have money in cash and make a lot of money. Normally, you know, when, when the markets are volatile, you can't make four or five percent on cash. Right now, that's a little different. Um, I believe in stocks for the long term. I think that you know, if you look at historically, 2022 is very rare where you have both stocks and bonds being down. But I wouldn't dismiss the 60/40. I think that diversification, as Margaret is really the, is really the most important part of building portfolios. And so 60/40 might be a little aggressive for retirees, but it depends upon your circumstances. I'm I'm still a big fan. All right. So as we wind this up, a couple of quick tips 
from both of you, from each of you, for those people listening regarding rules of thumb and how to move forward in your financial life, um, taking the right amount of advice, putting the right amount of stock in things like this. Margarita, I'll let you go first. Oh, I would just say, take the time to do the research or find a financial advisor that listens to you. Here's what you have to say. I think that's a start um, because it's your life. It's important to you. These are the things, money adds so much stress to family, relationships and whatnot. Wouldn't you want to have a peace of mind at the end of the day that you've done everything you can? Life throws you curveballs. You're, you're never going to be able to plan to the penny, but you can make some good decisions right now. If you're younger, start looking about in, looking to invest at a younger age. That's the one thing I see a lot of folks, they wait until they're in their 50s and all of a sudden, oh my God, I want to retire, but I don't have enough put away. 60-40 um, rule makes a lot of sense. It's a great, it's a great um, starting point. Um, it also helps people understand that you do need stocks in your portfolio. It's a good hedge against inflation, but it doesn't mean that you're taking a, a tremendous amount of risk with stocks. They're conservative stocks that you can buy that are dividend paying stocks that pay a dividend that'll help you with your cash flow needs. It's not like you have to jump into the crypto world and, and have this huge roller coaster ride and be stressed all the time. So I'm a big believer in if a, you can reduce stress in your life, do a wealth plan. Talk to somebody, take, have that conversation right now. Don't bury your head in the sand. Um, it's, it's not as overwhelming as people think. I mean, that's our job is to help you get through the minefield and, and to feel that you have control because we can only control certain things. So take control of your, of your life and, and your wealth. And I think, I think things will play out and be okay. David? Yeah, I think to echo just Maria's point about stress, I think that if you're if you're working with an advisor and all they talk about is an efficient portfolio, that's not going to help you when markets go down. I think understanding what you're trying to accomplish, what your income sources are, how you're going to feel about things, that's a real financial plan. Um, I think that we're evolving as an industry towards more holistic advice. There's a comment about financial therapy. But I think like that's what people need because the last thing you want is to make a bunch of choices when you first retire and then make the wrong one. So get help. And, and, and make choices around what, what, what makes it easier for you in retirement based upon how you want to enjoy it. Fantastic. David, Margarita, thank you so much for a great conversation. Leslie, I know you asked for the website. We are going to pop it up here um, as we say goodbye. It is protectedincome.org slash Blanchett hyphen Perry. You'll see it on your screen in just a second. Um, but again, guys, thank you so much for a great conversation. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye, everybody.